missing our pistol for me. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, okay, we have we have a we have a clerical we have a clerical matter to begin with. Somebody lost a pair of glasses upstairs. Does if anybody recognizes these? I will leave them here. Uh, possibly. My name is Yanis Evergenis, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the second session, which is entitled The Dilemmas of Politics in France and Europe. I want to begin by wishing Stanley, who just stepped out, a very happy birthday, <laughs> and by adding my own thanks to those of many others for his kindness and generosity and his example. I will save for later. Uh, my concluding remark, which is to say that I am deeply grateful for the privilege of having had him as a teacher. Now, though considerable, the trepidation with which I stand before you is slightly less than it ought to be, given the subject matter of the session and the stature of the three speakers that I'm about to present to you. The reason I have decided is that as I began contemplating the breadth and depth of Stanley's learning, I found them overwhelming to the point of liberation. I am simply not sure with the exception of Rousseau, that if I had been an expert on European politics, I would have had any more reason to feel secure in discussing Stanley's views and in such company. From my point of view, this session represents Stanley very well. The breadth of his learning is reflected in part in the topics that our speakers have chosen to address. The depth is captured fully by the distinguished speakers themselves. It is my great pleasure, therefore, to introduce Anne Saada, Suzanne Berger, and Christy MacDonald. Each of them will have about 15 minutes, as with the previous session. But for this session, we will then have Stanley uh, comment on uh, the presentations briefly before we open the floor to uh, discussion. Let me therefore introduce the speakers. 
Anne Saada is Joel Parker Professor of Law and Political Science in the Department of Government at Dartmouth. An undergraduate and graduate student of Stanley's, Professor Saada is the author of The Shaping of Liberal Politics in Revolutionary France, Germany's Second Chance, and Contemporary France, a Democratic Education. She will address Stanley's 1967 essay, In Search of France. Our second speaker, Suzanne Berger, is Raphael Dorman and Helen Starbuck Professor of Political Science and Class of 1960 Fellow at MIT, as well as Director of the MIT International Science and Technology Initiative Program. Her many works include Peasants Against Politics, The French Political System, which was originally published as part three of Patterns of Government, Notre Première Mondialisation, and recently How We Compete, What Companies Around the World Are Doing to Make It in Today's Global Economy. <coughs> Professor Berger will address Stanley's book, Decline or Renewal, France Since the 1930s. Our final speaker, Christy MacDonald, is Smith Professor of French Language and Literature and Professor of Comparative Literature at Harvard. She is the author of The Extravagant Shepherd, a study of pa the pastoral vision in Rousseau's Nouvelle Eloise, The Dialogue of Writing, Essays in 18th Century French Literature, The Proustian Fabric Associations of Memory, and most recently, the editor of Painting My World, The Art of Dorothy Eisner, and co-editor with Stanley of the forthcoming Rousseau and Freedom. She and Stanley have spent a lot of time thinking about Rousseau, the topic of Professor McDonald's talk. And with that, I will introduce Ansa. This panel is becoming more and more surprising. I didn't realize that Stanley was going to comment afterwards. It somehow has kind of... Oh, on the contrary, I'd be happy to sit down. I just, uh oh, oh, great. Now I feel even more relaxed. Um, as I was uh, sitting down to prepare this talk, I, um, I was, I was, I'd been warned by Peter that he would pull the plug after 15 minutes, and so I kept trying to cut it down. And I, I found that if I eliminated the essays in In Search of France, which Stanley did not write, if I skipped most of the major points, which he did make in his essay, and spoke very fast, um, that I could do it in about 20 minutes. And then I remembered a trick he used to use, which was to assume that a group of undergraduates uh, faced with an impossibly long reading list had actually done that reading. And he would just say, I assume you've read the book, and move on to a different argument, which you were then supposed to cope with. So I thought of just assuming that you'd read the book um, I, 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 I do assume that you've read the book, um, but I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I, I, what I'd like to do is, is, is not try to summarize the argument, but rather highlight three aspects of the essay. Um, first is its place in Stanley's um, record as a scholar, teacher, and what we now call a public intellectual. What, what, what did we call it when we had so many more of them? And they were so much, well, never mind, better, but... Um, anyway, I, I'd like to I'd like to place this this first work. We there we go. <laughs> um, secondly, I'd like to um, take its key substantive finding, um, and uh, and and talk about that a little bit. So so the substantive finding, another phrase we didn't use, linking a central argument of the French um, socio-cultural system, namely the French style of authority to the paradoxes of its political system. And then finally, I'd like to discuss the continued relevance of both Stanley's approach to his topic and his substantive finding um, almost a half a century after the book's original publication. Okay, so first, where does In Search of France um, fit in? In Search of France followed the 1956 publication of Stanley's book on the Pujadas movement, which, which was a kind of flash in the pan movement, but it actually he analyzed it as it was still flashing in the pan. Um, it was a noisy anti-tax, anti-incumbent, anti-parliamentarian, anti-intellectual, anti-us um, kind of a movement. And in that essay, which Stanley wrote on the on the movement, he outlined many of the arguments about French liberalism, which he would later develop in um, in other in other works and courses. It also followed more recently and even more importantly, the creation of that superb year-long course on political doctrines and society, modern France, to which reference has already been made. 
and into which, as Stanley put it in that 1993 Feshra piece that someone else also quoted, he, he said of himself, he said, I poured everything I knew and thought about France and out of which came most of what I later wrote on her. Um, in that Feshriff essay, Stanley described his other year-long course, War, Soxai 112, um, which somebody, somebody called the course. Those of us who took to Soxai 117 would dispute which one was the course. Um, I took both, and they both seemed to me to have been the courses with a capital T and a capital C. Um, but he, he described that, uh, that, that other course on war as, as owing much to his mentor, Raymond Aron, and in contrast, um, the French course was his own. Now, I actually think what this represents is the capacity for self-delusion of someone, even of Stanley's stature. I don't, I've only read our own. I didn't have the privilege of studying with him, but I don't think that um, Soxai 112 was particularly derivative, uh, much less Stanley's work in IR generally. Um, that, that he poured everything he knew in Fra about France um, into that course and that it became, uh, it, was, it was a year-long course which he wanted to turn into a three-semester course. Um, it, even three semesters would not have been able to accommodate um, what he knew. Uh, those of us lucky to have taken that course, I think, uh, are not self-deluded when we feel that we are, vis-a-vis um, -vis the study of France, we are in the position that Stanley felt himself to be in as he looked at international relations after studying, um, after studying with our own. Um, we can sort of, we can apply Stanley's framework, we can tinker with it, um, but really it's very hard to get away with it, uh, to get away from it. It's actually quite hard to get away from it and who would want to if you get away from it by skipping over to another country or switching to a different topic in political science, different area, and, and, and you, know, you find yourself um, trying to reproduce uh, the intellectual approach um, to your new topic that Stanley so, um, so, so, so well exemplified in his study, in his study of France. Um, so uh, so it's, it's an impressive essay, I think, um, for f on its intellectual merits, its puzzle was um, its puzzle was change. Uh, the CFIA had introduced a research program on change in post-war Europe. Um, Robert Bowie had written in the introduction that change was the major feature in every in every area of the world in the post-war era, er, era, and uh, and I believe anticipated a series of of country studies. France was going to be the first on that list, um, and and the team was supposed to get its brain around change. So the the puzzle for the team was, um, in intellectual terms, was what does it mean for our understanding of politics when society and politics are so visibly and dramatically out of sync? Since that was kind of the major the, the major um, observation that uh, came to light as, as the team studied France. Um, woven into that, to, to this extraordinarily erudite and complicated intellectual argument about change that Stanley makes in, in his essay is, um, is a set of practical questions. And I think other people have alluded to this point. This is, this is somebody whose who's, who's intellectual power think, you know, has, has at some point probably intimidated every person in this room. Um, and, yet, and yet there were practical questions about change that motivated his work on France, motivated his work on IR. So the practical questions that run through all his analyses are fr of France are what can be done to change the style of authority that I'll discuss in a second, a style of, of, of authority that regularly cripples reform efforts and sinks reformist politicians like Mendes France, whose unhappy experience in power preceded the writing of the book by just you know, about five years. Um, how do we get to use the phrase that somebody else quoted earlier? How do we get to the right kind of politics that will um, enable change? Um, the problem of change in democratic adaptation 
is still very much with us, and the school system um, that Stanley identified as sort of the linchpin of any change story in, in France is um, really still part of the problem rather than having become part of the solution. Okay, so let me turn for a second to the major interpretive um, contributions of Stanley's essay, which um, I think are two. They lay first in the description of what he called uh, the Republican synthesis, and especially of its key element, the, sta the stalemate society, and secondly, in his exploration of the main paradox apparent in the disruption of that synthesis, um, namely this disjunction between, uh, between changes in society, which had taken place, changes in France's external environment, which had also taken place, you would have thought that would have produced um, political change, and yet uh, it hadn't. Um, the Republican synthesis emerging in the late 1870s after a century of chronic political instability and lasting until it was disrupted by the Depression, the rise of fascism, and the resurgence of German power explained the relative success of the Third Republic. It was a synthesis in the sense that, and I quote from Stanley's essay, the main features of society, the political system, and the French vision of the world, of the outside world, fitted together. The stalemate society had three traits. This is where I started getting myself into trouble. Um, okay, the stalemate society had three traits. The first was a hybrid socioeconomic system that featured, um, that, that mixed features of feudal agrarian societies with features characteristic of industrial societies. It was on its way out by the time Stanley wrote his essay, and it's now gone, though the anti-capitalist values associated with it explain why France, or help explain why France, has had such a difficult time adjusting to the economic aspects of globalization. It was the other two traits of the stalemate society, namely the French style of authority and the country's weak associational life that resisted change and that seemed to explain so many features of the country's political life, irrespective of political regime. Stanley's understanding of the French style of authority built on Tocqueville's indictment of centralization. Like Tocqueville, Stanley saw a vicious circle linking centralization to poor cooperative skills and also to a, a social allergy to certain kinds of in-your-face um, inequality, so, so immediate inequality, immediately experienced inequality. Stanley attributed the poor cooperative skills to an aversion to, quote, face-to-face -face discussions leading to compromises through participation of all parties involved in a problem. Face-to-face -face discussions were painful in two respects. First, they involved conflict, and secondly, they led to where they revealed unequal power relations among participants. Taken together with other structural and ad attitudinal char characteristics of the stalemate society, the aversion to face-to-face -face relations made it all but impossible to devise political institutions which were both consensual and sufficiently sturdy to deal with significant shocks, whether those shocks were domestic or external. Stanley noted that like the stalemate society's social system, the French style of authority was a mixed model. It was partially authoritarian, but not authoritarian enough to suffer a real dictatorship for long, um, and partially democratic, but not democratic enough to sustain a vibrant, adaptable liberal democratic regime. The depression and the war had destroyed the Republican synthesis. The defeat had brought former outsiders to power, both at Vichy and um, then through the resistance. The combination of outside shocks and new policies generated by the outsiders had transformed French society. And yet the political system created at the, lib at the liberation was a dismal failure. And Stanley did not find the Gaullist response inaugurated in 1958 particularly reassuring. Under very different institutional arrangements, two major problems from the Fourth Republic were persisting into the early Fifth Republic. The first had to do with the instruments of representation, the parties and the party system. The second had to do with leadership. Um, and Suzanne will perhaps talk about Stanley's work on leadership as it, as it was developed in decline or renewal, um, a kind of alternation between heroic leadership 
and mediocre ineffective leadership, both of which had, um, had, were essentially illegitimate um, and tended to feed off of each other. Uh, the result of the, of the dysfunctional leadership patterns were dysfunctional citizenship patterns, where, where citizens acted more like subjects, alternating between um, sullen obedience and insurrection. Okay, so now fast forward a half a century. The Fifth Republic at 50 is coming up on the Third Republic's record as the longest running French regime since the revolution. The system has survived some very, um, has, has survived some very significant shocks and has been modified by a cascade of not insignificant institutional reforms. And I'm pretty sure that I got to age 17 without ever using a double negative. And then I met Stanley, and now I use them all the time. So they were not insignificant institutional reforms. And yet France's representative mechanisms are in particularly sad shape, and the country continues to search for a democratic model of leadership. Um, looking at the early Fifth Republic, Stanley was tempted to say, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. So what should we say, narratively and analytically, about the Republic of Sarkozy and Royale? How my, how's my time? Okay. Um, so let me review, I, I, I don't, this is another thing Stanley used to do, except he did it for the First World War. So we're in the middle of the course and he looks up at the lecture, in the lecture and he says, I assume, we'd kind of gotten to 1914, I assume you all know that between 1914 and 1918, there was a war. Um, so I assume that we all know that the 60s happened, that it put participatory st stresses on democratic systems everywhere, and that it also generated um, what Francois Dubé, a French sociologist, has called, has called the crisis of the institution, which is a much less grumpy and angry version of arguments that Samuel Huntington once made about deinstitutionalization. Um, so, so we know that that happened, and then along came what we started out calling the economic cross crisis in the 1970s, and what we now call globalization. Uh, these shocks have brought in their wake enormous changes in France. Um, changes, I don't know, it's kind of like the guy's question about is it worse or better um, now than it was in 1945. I was trying to think as I did the lecture, I was trying to think, are these changes commensurate with the changes brought about by the depression, the occupation, um, the liberation? I couldn't quite figure it out. But the eclipse of the Catholic Church, which is really kind of down at zero, um, the collapse of the Communist Party, and with it the deinstitutionalization of those, those bands of, of underprivilege around French cities that now explode from time to time. Long-term mass unemployment the demise of the Jacobin model, both as a model, as this kind of intellectual model, and as a, as a practical way of getting things done. Increasing European um, integration. The emergence of Islam as, a, as an important domestic social category. I, I amused myself by checking the index, and of course, no, um, nothing like it. Uh, and nor is laicite in the index. Um, and nor, I believe, does it appear anywhere in the essay, but since we couldn't, you know, it's not searchable. I would have had to read it word by word. Um, so those are, the, 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 this revival and transformation of, of laicite, which I think is, is a very significant development, I would, I would also list as, as a change. Meanwhile, the French have adopted significant institutional reforms, and I'll name just four, just to, um, one, one because it's massively, it was, it was, it was a huge reform, and the others because they're recent and, and significant. So the decentralization reforms of, of, the, of the 1980s passed by the Mitterrand government uh, just after the socialists were elected. Secondly, the reduction of the presidential term from seven to five years in 2000. Thirdly, the reordering of the electoral calendar so that presidential elections now precede parliamentary elections um, unless the president dies or dissolves the assembly, which well, death is always permitted, and the Constitution permits dissolution of the National Assembly. And finally, the constitutional amendments adopted last summer supposedly to enlarge the scope of parliamentary powers. 
A longer list of, uh, of reforms would show that these reforms have affected every major area of French political life. The hybrid nature of the political system and more generally the distribution of power among the branches of government, the reach and role of the state, the territorial distribution of power and the definition of French sovereignty. Despite the shocks and in the institutional reforms and sometimes because of them, the political system is still a mess. Now as when Stanley was writing his essay for In Search of France, the areas of particularly glaring dysfunction include the parties and, and political leadership and now as then, institutions are part of the problem rather than being part of the solution. The regime remains suspended between a presidential and a parliamentary model. Since 1962, presidentialism has been favored by both practice, regardless of who was in power, and by constitutional reforms. The stated purpose of the constitutional amendments adopted last July, namely to strengthen parliament, was contradicted by the process used to pass the amendments and more generally by the practices of the current administration. And the reforms themselves, even on paper, are ambiguous in their likely impact. The essential point here is that in the absence of a clear choice about the type of regime, it's very difficult to adopt a reform strategy that can address the real problem areas, especially in a country where institutional reform is almost inevitably instrumentalized and deformed by short-term political calculations. Another vicious circle. Um, if the country were to embrace the presidential regime, then one would hope to see reforms aimed at improving checks and balances, or more generally, at making the branches of government into an optimal governing team. If the country wants to move back toward a parliamentary regime, then the purpose of reform should be to enhance the position and increase the resources, resources of the opposition. But this, of course, assumes the existence of an opposition. And a look at France's, France, France's parties makes one wonder. It especially made one wonder in mid-November in mid when the Socialist Party was kind of committing suicide on national television. Um, so it's hard to find anything good to say about French parties. Um, start with a couple of general remarks. The Fifth Republic's bipolar moment um, didn't last. It didn't last in part because of the durability of political ideas to which Stanley in his career paid so much attention, and in part because PR, proportional representation and electoral laws are used in regional and European elections, um, thus contradicting, co contradicting the, the, elect, the, the institutional logic of the rules used in, in, other, in, in other national elections. Um, the party system is, again, fragmented. For an illustration, recall the disastrous presidential elections of 2002, where in the first round of a two-round voting system, the top three candidates got just over 50% of the vote between the three of them, and the left was left unrepresented in the second round because Le Pen edged the socialist candidate for second place. Um, second point here, even worse, the larger parties are often internally divided on major issues. For example, laicite, and secondly, um, most obviously in, in the recent past, the European Constitution. Then moving from sort of general points about the parties uh, to dysfunctions on the right, unlike German conservatives who finally got it right after 1945, the French right never figured out how to come together for partisan competition. Instead, we've seen a parade of parties on the right, initially in part a reflection of continuing ideological and temperamental divisions um, evident on the right since the revolution, uh, but increasingly just an expression of personal rivalries. Okay, and then we come to the socialist left, and here I hardly know where to begin. Um, the Socialist Party promoted presidentialism, but never really accepted it. Um, and those hesitations are reflected in the internal organization of the party, which manages, as others have noted, to combine the worst aspects of the Fourth and the Fifth Republics. And I'll spare you the, the details. The party has practiced a version of economic liberalism since 1983, but again, it's never come to terms with it, leaving the party intellectually behind reality by at least one crisis or you know, one sort of major uh, challenge. 
The party helped to do in the Communist Party, but continues to look over its left shoulder, refusing um, at its, in its latest declaration of principles uh, to resign itself to what it calls the divisions created by history. And unfortunately, when the PS looks over its, its left shoulder, it sees something, um, namely this young guy, um, Olivier Besancenot, um, whom a, a really nauseatingly large number of French uh, voters seem to view positively. Um, and since Mitterrand's exit, leadership has been reduced to one short-term calculation after another, exemplified by Jospin's ill-considered party reforms of 1995, the reforms that helped produce last month's fiasco. Um, so, so we've clearly got, uh, we've clearly got a problem with the party system, especially since I'm skipping paragraphs on my notes, you know that we have a problem with the party system. Um, leadership has taken a rather surprising turn in the persons of the current president and, uh, and, and Sigolin Royale, the unhappy candidate for um, head of the Socialist Party from, from last month and the former presidential candidate. The model seems to me very different from earlier patterns, but certainly not an improvement. And I'll stick with Sarkozy because actually he's, the two of them strike me as quite similar in many ways. Um, he's just sort of more so as the, as the Casablanca line has it, right. Um, so he's constantly in action on public display, implementing reforms. If you go to his website, it starts talking to you before you press any buttons and you actually <laughs> have to clutch, okay. Um, um, he's happy to exhibit his lack of culture, his lack of class, his lack of self-control and to parade his private life in public in ways that are really quite unprecedented. It's impossible to discern what he's about except himself, and he doesn't mistake himself for France. Um, so so uh, I, I really have no idea what he's about. Um, related to all of the above, he, he sucks the air out of the room without being, um, without being charismatic. Um, <laughs> And he appears to have no underlying analysis of any problem. So there's no consistent approach to any problem. And he's too careless with regard to substance and too contemptuous with regard to people and coalitions to qualify as pragmatic. Um, new, new communications technologies certainly make this kind of leadership possible, but Obama proves that they don't make it um, inevitable. So, um, going back to Stanley's work and in conclusion, I'm concluding, I'm done. Um, I, I, find it, uh, I find it moving, I think is the only way I can put it, that someone so gifted at identifying unintended consequences and vicious circles and so focused on a country where the real answer is no we can't um, would be... <laughs> so enthusiastic and uh, so, so joyous at the outcome of a campaign whose slogan was, yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, delighted to have been invited to participate in uh, this celebration of Stanley Hoffman and uh, to have been asked to talk about the theme of decline and renewal as it's listed in the program. Uh, at first I thought I would uh, uh, send an email and remind the organizers of the event that the title of Stanley's book of 35 years ago was actually decline or renewal, uh, <laughs> France since the 1930s. Uh, and, um, and, and this book is a collection of articles and essays that starts with what Hoffman calls the fall, and the fall is Vichy France, moves on to redemption, liberation, in sections he calls authority and society, the goal, and then uh, the nation and the world, and then concludes with a reflection, <clears throat> a somewhat melancholic reflection, as I, I'm going to try to explain, called uh, Decline or Renewal. 
So it is uh, the Klein Ore Renewal is indeed Stanley's title, but I'm thinking it over more. I decided that the organizers of today's event actually had it right, that taking Stanley's work on France as a whole, it is truly an account of decline and renewal. More generally, it's an effort to understand the mechanisms through which political communities in moral and political decay can be mobilized to recreate themselves on the foundations of their own highest values and traditions. And I think this is the theme that links his work on Vichy, on the Pujadists, on De Gaulle, and the Fifth Republic. And it's also, I think, though it's not what I'll be talking about this afternoon, I think it's the invisible link to his analyses and critique of American politics. To my ears, at least, his writings on American politics sound like efforts to identify the resources and traditions with which we Americans could bootstrap ourselves out of our decline and like a trumpet call to rouse the political will to do it. So with respect to the case of France in particular, uh, Stanley Hoffman's first great work is really a work on the dark side of French politics. Uh, its work, uh, the work on the dark side is about a political community in decay and self-destructive mode. Uh, and it's, uh, it's on the Third Re Republic, a regime turned in on itself and paralyzed, unable to organize politically except along its old battle lines of historic cleavages, church, state, anti-statism, class, conflict. And uh, these themes are repeated in Stanley's first great piece of research, which was the 1956 study of the Pujadas, which Anne has already mentioned. The Pujadas movement was a right-wing, populist, xenophobic movement that was catalyzed by a failed shopkeeper protesting over his taxes. And this protest escalated into a mass movement, a new party, in the election of 52 deputies to the National Assembly. I think already in his treatment of the Pujadist movement, uh, one can see the distinctive elements of a Hoffman analysis. Hoffman starts by first recognizing the importance of the economic and social materials out of which interests arise. But then he argues that we cannot understand politics as a product of interests, ideas, leadership, and the distinctive features of different regimes shape interests, shape interests at their core. Interests are indeterminate. They're not only intermediated by political movements, parties, and leaders, they're uh, fundamentally crystallized by, their interests are produced as interests uh, by politics. So in the case of Pujadism, it's true, and uh, Stanley certainly uh, explains this at considerable length, it's true that the troops of Pujadism were losers in a modernizing France that really had no room for them and really little compassion for them. Uh, but most critically, uh, the Pujadists were the disappointed, embittered losers in a republic uh, whose essential values they had once shared. Uh, whose essential protection they felt was part of their birthright as, as, as French citizens. And so anti-system politics grows up along the fault lines of the Republican regime. It's a product of Republican politics. It's its own inner dynamics uh, work, work, working out here. This France of Hoffman's uh, Le Mouvement Poujade, 1956, was the first France that I knew my first uh, trip to France was as a homestay student in Lyon in uh, 1957. And this was a time of tremendous political discouragement in France. In foreign affairs, France was still reeling from defeat in Vietnam and Suez. Uh, the Algerian rebellion was exploding. Uh, at home, the situation looked very bad. The country had already been through 23 governments since the end of the war. The balance of trade was in deep deficit. The treasury was bare, and the government was borrowing heavily abroad. Uh, the Pujadas had captured almost 10% of registered voters, uh, and they showed no signs of disappearing. 
there was a pervasive sense of social and political immobility, even to someone who was a newcomer like me. Uh, there are surveys that I've found that show that when people were asked in 1957 whether their generation would be different from the generation of their parents. Now remember who the generation of the parents were. The parents were people who'd gone through the Depression. Uh, many of them had been through two world wars. Uh, only 16% of people who answered this question in the middle 50s thought that their own generation would represent something new. I mean, this is big scale <laughs> pessimism. Ask whether the question was, uh, uh, can people like you have an influence on the destiny of France, or do you have the feeling of being entirely at the mercy of events? 60% of those answering the question said that they were à la merci des événements uh, and could have no influence. Uh, and, 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 and so uh, this is a kind of extraordinary picture in the middle, 70, uh, middle 50s of immobilism and pessimism. And yet what's so extraordinary is that just a year later, and, uh, with, uh, and, and really by the early 60s, things did change in what appeared to be an absolutely miraculous fashion. Just uh, one measure of this change uh, is the way in which France appeared to skeptical Americans. In 1958, uh, a RAND Corporation study of France had described a stalemated, technologically backward society. Only four years later, 1962, President Kennedy was requesting his Council of Economic Advisors to, quote, consider particularly the case of France, which has had rather extraordinary economic vitality uh, for, for potential lessons about accelerating growth in the United States. And within France, too, uh, this I in the early 60s, the perception of a society on the move translated it into almost miraculous the greater confidence about the future and about what role citizens could play in influencing the, the future. By 1968, the number of French who thought themselves wholly without influence on France's future had dropped to 20% from 60% 10 years earlier. So there was a palpable sense of modernization, of, uh, of, of potential for citizens, and people began to see themselves as very different from earlier generations, where only 16% of the French in 1957 thought they were different, would be different, or would have a fate different than their parents. By 1978, three quarters of the French answering survey questions thought that they were really quite different uh, from their parents' generation. So the question is, how could the Fifth Republic have changed so much so quickly? Well, one answer, I guess, to this was the answer that uh, Raymond Daron offered, which was that, in fact, uh, it was just a great illusion that, in fact, there was a tremendous economic and social uh, dynamism to the Fourth Republic, uh, and that uh, people simply hadn't understood how much was really at change and at work. But I think, really, that uh, the answer that Stanley Hoffman has offered in, in, in his writing is, in, in, uh, captures a much deeper truth than our own statement. And perhaps that's the sense in which you invented your story on France, or really out of, out of your own reflections. Because in order f for this new France to emerge, whatever the scale of social and economic transformation uh, by the end of the 1950s, there was need for the kind of opening and catalyst that normal politics does not create. Renewal out of the ashes of Vichy, out of the stalemated conflicts of the Fourth Republic, took something very different than politics as usual. And here's, I think, where part two of, of decline or renewal uh, of, of Stanley's essays really fits into the story of decay <laughs> and rebirth. Uh, it's, uh, and part two is about the goal, about the goal as a, uh, a man in politics of an altogether extraordinary kind. It's, first of all, about the goal as an artist, as an artist whose first and most consequential creation is himself, and who creates, along with himself, a vision of France, of its qualities, its strengths, 
its mission in the world. The question is, how does someone who has this kind of mission, how does such a leader actually work to create the openings in a political community that allow its possibilities to come through? Now, I think this question of how such a leader works in such a community is a question that Stanley does not wholly explain. I think he argues, or what one can pull out of his argument, is that there's a kind of pedagogic role, uh, a role, a kind of teaching the French that they were capable of more and better than what they were doing in, 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 in politics. And here I think uh, very much, as I've myself tried to, I guess the good teacher sort of shows you the dots but doesn't necessarily tell you how all the dots connect. When, when I think of this question of how the leader, how the leader transforms the, the, the community, I, th I, th I often have thought about uh, Gunnar Myrdal's uh, work on the American dilemma, where Gunnar Myrdal describes, this is a book that was written in the 1940s, Myrdal describes his visit to the American South. He said there are really two ways of thinking about Southerners. On one hand, sociologists and many others see the South as a tightly integrated community in which racism, are the, co the core values, white supremacy, are the core values of this community. And it's tightly and coherently, its norms are tightly and coherently organized around, around these ideas. Uh, uh, and if this were the case, said Myrdal, the only way such a community could change would be by extraordinary external coercion, something like Sherman's army back again, uh, driving, uh, 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 shatter shattering this community. But Myrdal's vision is really quite different from the Southerner. Myrdal sees the Southerners as people who have contradictory beliefs that they hold both at the same time. Yes, racist beliefs about white supremacy, but they also believe that all men are created equal. They also believe that somehow people in, in, in the American community have a kind of equal rights in the, uh, as, as, as human beings, whatever their race, uh, religion, or, or, or ethnic origins. And these beliefs uh, coexist uh, on, on a day-to-day -day basis in people and are able to coexist uh, exactly because people are never confronted with situations in which they have to reconcile these conflicts and contradictions on behalf of one or the other set uh, 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 of, uh, of belief. Myrdal argues that the role of leadership, the role of the federal government in this case, could be actually to push people into a situation where they themselves would face their own contradictions. And uh, I think Myrdal had a very great optimism that people would reconcile their contradictions uh, 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 in, in, in a more positive sense. And this, and from this point of view, what the leader does or what leaders can do what de Gaulle did was lead not by infusing the followers with his ideas and vision. The leader works by leveraging into power a set of values and possibilities, norms, traditions that are already present in a community and that exist in some uneasy contradiction and tension with other views, uh, uh, w with other visions. I think this is heroism of a very special kind and quite different from what we mean by charismatic leadership. I think Stanley remains fascinated by this kind of leadership and this kind of person. And perhaps it explains one of his very few passions that I don't share, uh, which is for Dominique de Villepin. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the problem is that politics does not ordinarily throw up such men and women. And absent them, uh, I think, as uh, Stanley's view, societies are not really likely to be able to have the resources or the springs or the motors to be able to reform themselves. And this, I think, accounts for the rather melancholic tone at the end of decline or renewal. Yes, France has been renewed, but it's hard to see exactly how this task will, will continue. And I guess I thought always that this was a rather too pessimistic view of things. 
until really the last elections in France. <laughs> uh, when, um, when, you know, I thought and here uh, I just mentioned the, the work of uh, a group of younger French and, and, and American scholars, all of whom were Stanley students at one time or another, Pepper Culpepper, the volume that you and Peter Hall and Bruno Pallier put together that showed the extraordinary level of social and economic and generational change in France. I, I thought, uh, in, 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 in some sense, the situation that seemed to me analogous to the Fourth Republic. And so I thought that even if Ségolène Royal and Nicolas Sarkozy were to de Gaulle somehow as Napoleon III was to the great <laughs> Napoleon, <laughs> that maybe still this could be enough uh, to create the openings uh, through which new politics could, could, could emerge that this could be enough to create the openings in the system. But I was wrong, and my old teacher has uh, taught me yet again another, uh, a another lesson about politics. When I, just in conclusion, to say that uh, today, uh, the first lecture I ever heard from Stanley, which was in 1960 in Gov 114, is still uh, as vivid to me, I think, as uh, in the day after I heard it. It was the main points were that politics matters, that power can never be reduced to social or economic or psychological determinisms, that politics involves choice, imagination, political will, and that the most important thing for us as social scientists to analyze is how human beings shape and reshape collective possibilities, never wholly free, never wholly constrained. <coughs> And then there was the implicit point that France is a kind of unique terrain for being able to see these forces at work through history. I know that uh, whenever uh, the, the, voice of, the voice of the real teacher is the voice that one hears for life. And I know that this is the voice that many of Stanley's old students hear. There was once a moment when four of us uh, 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 Carl Kaiser, Patrice Gonet, Peter Gorovich, and I were doing a project together in a godforsaken mining town outside of Grenoble. And over dinner one night, we confessed to each other that none of us was able to write anything without hearing the voice of that teaching, teacher, wondering, challenging, arguing, grappling with uh, the hardest questions. And as I look around the room this afternoon, I know uh, at least I guess that for many of you, it's the same thing. I'm delighted to be speaking in this panel. I'm substituting for Patrice Igonet, who could not be here, um, and that's an impossible task. So I'm going to present something on a work in progress with Stanley. I was, I was never lucky enough to be Stanley's student. Uh, I got to know him when I arrived here uh, in 1994 in the Department of Romance Languages and Literatures. And um, I'm going to try to give you a slightly different uh, perspective on a work in progress. I think, I believe, I'm, the on, I'm one of the only, if not the only humanist, at least from Harvard in this conference. Uh, and I'd like to stress that Stanley, in his deep and abiding interest in all things culturally and politically French, is an avid reader of French literature, as I'm sure you know, and has been a great friend to the Department of Romance, Languages, and Literatures. He taught a wonderful course on Camus recently, uh, twice taught a, a course with Susan Suleiman, on War and Memory, Representation of World War II in French History, Literature, and Film. And I've also had the privilege of teaching a seminar twice with Stanley on Rousseau. Um, so I think the connection with the last talk by Suzanne is probably never wholly free, never wholly constrained. Um, out of the uh, experience of teaching, Stanley and I decided <coughs> to co-organize a conference at the beautiful Rockefeller Foundation's Conference Center in Bellagio, Italy, which unfortunately Stanley missed. He was so busy lecturing and doing things around Harvard uh, 
that he misstepped in the Broadway uh, garage and was unable to join us um, in Bellagio. His presence was everywhere, however, um, in the thoughts and the work of the people at the conference. Um, and the conference was actually quite remarkable, not only because of the magical site, but because something happened intellectually in, through the presentation and dialogue among the participants, half of whom were from political science and half of whom were from literature and of different generations that actually could not have been predicted. And so Stanley and I have gone on to edit a volume titled, uh, that uh, Yanis mentioned, and Yanis is in, uh, titled Rousseau and Freedom, uh, forthcoming from Cambridge University Press. I wrote to a few of s the Stanley students and colleagues in this Rousseau project um, this week and asked uh, what for them was the most important uh, thing in Stanley's work. And several wrote back to me, especially about his work in international relations the subject of the first panel today. Uh, let me just quote from Tracy Strong, professor at the University of California in San Diego. Dear Christie, not only did Stanley's early essay on Rousseau and Kant and international relations help me shape my own approach to Rousseau, but more importantly, it taught me not to look at Rousseau or anyone else as providing an analysis of the permanent structure of international relations, but rather as setting out the problematic within which international relations take place. Stanley understood, as had Rousseau, that there is no escape from our frightful present. His realism, quote unquote, is not that of the would-be tough-minded, but of the wise. Please send him my best, from Tracy. Um, so what I'm going to try to do very briefly is give you a sense of where this, um, uh, this volume is going. Uh, I'm going to try to give you a sense also of Stanley's essay. So if Stanley does uh, to me what he did uh, to Bob Cohane, as recounted this morning, uh, it will be fine if he attacks me on what I say about him. But if he attacks me on what we say together, we'll have to re we'll go back to ca copy editing. So, <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> so the book began uh, with the sense that freedom, one of the longest standing ideals in the West, is in today's world increasingly compromised and a subject for deep concern. Revisiting the past and thereby bringing it back into the present provides a means of reflecting on this issue beyond the soundbite. The debates about freedom were first set out in their modern version by Rousseau, who sought to investigate the relationship between freedom and equality in two potentially conflicting arenas, that of humankind and of the citizen. His ideas and analyses were taken up during the philosophical enlightenment, as you know, often invoked during the French Revolution and still resonate, I believe, in contemporary discussions of freedom. Throughout his work, Rousseau writes about the conditions for, precisely, and the constraints on liberty as he formulates ways in which to change the relationship of the individual to society. In this volume, we challenge the sense of an either-or philosophy that opposes the private and the public, the mind and the body. The essays show that contrary to Jacobin or totalitarian interpretations of Rousseau's work, in which the individual is said to have little or no place, Rousseau's writings reflect on the role of feeling and passion in relation to reason, free will in relation to natural goodness, as well as a practice of being in the world necessary to existence. Ra Rousseau offers not one, but several conceptions of, liter of um, liberty. The authors, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, Yanis is one, explore how different forms of liberty emerge in Rousseau's writing from the early to the late works. There are at least three kinds of freedom. First, the liberty of man and the state of nature before the development of a moral sense and of a sense, a social sense going beyond compassion. Second, there is the liberty of man in a perfect society, the society described in the social contract in which man is part of a community ruled by the general will. And as he writes in chapter seven of the contract, social contract, Quote, anyone who dares to institute a people must feel capable of, so to speak, changing human nature, of transforming each individual who by himself is a perfect and solitary whole into part of a larger whole from which that individual would, as it were, receive his life and his being. Third and finally, when society is imperfect and when it is corrupt and decadent, as, it, as was the case for so believed for his own society, there is a third kind of freedom, not that of the citizen, but that of the individual, endowed with a sense of morality and trying to live an independent life amidst unsavory society. So in Stanley's essay, 
uh, titled in English, The Mirage of the General Will, there's a wonderful footnote, I believe it's footnote one, um, in which he says, this essay was written in 1953 and published in French in the Revue Internationale d'Histoire Politique et Constitutionnelle. Fifty years later, I, Stanley, still agree with my younger self. <laughs> And he suggests that how one reads reflects on who one is. Uh, quote, hasn't every one of those who have written about Rousseau revealed just as much about himself or herself as about Rousseau, which minimizes the risk of repetition? <laughs> so let me try to give you a thumbnail of Stanley's uh, argument, mostly in Stanley's words or a paraphrase, but I'm going to not give you all the quotation marks. Uh, for Rousseau, the purpose of the state is to preserve human freedom. And the problem is, as Rousseau writes in The Social Contract, to quote Rousseau, find a form of association by which each rem one remains as free as before, end quote. The general will is the formula which guarantees a fusion of liberty and authority. And liberty here is defined in moral terms. It is obedience to an internal necessity. Authority is the rule of this necessity in the state, but and, here is one, but, and here is one of the key questions, can such a fusion of liberty and authority last? Now, nothing, according to Stanley, allows one to assert that the principles of the social contract could be applied and could be so lastingly if, by some miracle, they were applied someday. Why? In the first place, Stanley writes, like classical econ economists, not a neutral comment in today's context, Rousseau puts himself in ideal conditions as if the problem had already been resolved, whereas the real question is how to resolve the problem. Second, Rousseau provides no indication on the means of obtaining those ideal conditions in which he places himself and in which the essence of the general will surely will be present and could be revealed by the calculation, he writes, of voices. Rousseau certainly provides recipes, but, and I quote Stanley, here aren't worth much, they aren't worth much despite what Rousseau seems to believe. And I might add that Rousseau continually turned from the real to the ideal uh, as a triggering mechanism for his innovative thinking uh, when he says, uh, for example, famously in the Second Discourse, let us begin by setting all the, sides, uh, all the facts aside. The, <laughs> the call to a methodology of hypothesis and theory outside of experience and historical evidence, even though he refers, of course, to both. Stanley further um, uh, refers to this discussion in his postface. We have a preface signed by me, we have a postface signed by Stanley, and then in between we have all the essays. Um, and in this postface to the volume, he honors his dear late friend Judith Sklar, um, <coughs> who I never had the privilege of meeting, unfortunately, by continuing his dialogue with her and with us. He writes, the requirements Rousseau sets up for the community of the social contract make it clear that he did not believe it could be a widely relevant solution to the problem of political liberty, liberty in the polis. Without the corrupt world of modern civilization, he never ceased to renounce. He adds to Sklar's discussion about men and citizens that was one must choose between making a man or a citizen, for one cannot do both, her argument, that concerning Rousseau's somber view of what is, the, the, the possibility of protecting humans and what Rousseau described in his anthropological work as inequality and moral de degeneracy goes against, um, the, I'm sorry, the concerning Rousse Rousseau's somber view of what is, that there is uh, the possibility of protecting humans from what Rousseau describes as the inequality and moral degeneracy of contemporary society against the ideal of the mirage. And he gives, Stanley gives two examples. The first, and I, I won't stop on this one, is from the Emile, in which uh, freedom is not about doing what one wishes to do. And the second one, uh, uh, in the second one, Stanley looks to the Julie, uh, the Nouvelle Louise, Rousseau's remarkable novel, which includes a sketch of the road to or the path to the social contract in action. And it's here, in my opinion, that Stanley opens the political contract to the questioning of the literary text. In a narrative about the possibility, this is the novel, uh, of changing society as it is rather than as it should be, Stanley contends that three solutions are possible. One, a reasoned form of manipulation or um, the character who is a dispassionate puppeteer. 
Two, protection of one's inner self against social burdens and injustices. And three, the ability to turn, as Rousseau did in his final works, The Confessions, The Dialogues, and The Reveries, to a kind of inner exile, choosing the freedom of the outcast. The third sense is developed in a number of essays in the volume to show how in um, these late works, freedom emerge merges with an autonomous sense of will and the development of an inner moral life in existence based on sentiment and individual reason that's more tempered than it is rigid uh, in its universalization. Does one view here annihilate another in thinking about Rousseau? I don't think so. Um, the changes, inconsistencies, disconnects, and perplexities in Rousseau's work are part of what makes his thought great. Interpreting Rousseau's works one with and against the other, assessing the political, aesthetic, and ethical interactions among them, as we did when we taught together, and the authors in the volume do as they write, is a form of dialogue with thinkers. It makes the discussion, while it is of course historical, seem very present to me. A last example for you. In his essay, Stanley added to his 1953 essay, I think, had to be, his dialogue with himself, the following thought. Quote, perhaps the ideal of the social contract is only a hypothesis for days of sacred national unity Union, I'm sorry, national union, usually an enemy. I, Stanley, have seen it happen once in my years in France, after the liberation of 1944-45, following a horrible, disastrous period of civil strife and enemy occupation. It only lasted a few weeks. During my life in America, I have also seen it happen only once, under very different circumstances. After 9-11-2001, and especially at the time of the invasion of Iraq, where the general will was largely manufactured by a government that did not hesitate to resort to catastrophic lies." End quote. I want to thank you, Stanley, for ongoing conversations about the present as well as the past, for being my colleague, my co-editor, and to make the segue to the next panel, my friend, a happy birthday. Thank you. I think, well, <laughs> it, goes, it goes without saying. <laughs> France is a very difficult country to, to write about. Uh, how, uh, and indeed, uh, I left the, a little bit also by Africa. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. I left because of having this, uh, spent a year here hiding from my French formidable thesis director who was a professor of international law, a distinguished lady who during the war was a teacher in Lyon where she had the reputation of being, in a very sexist remark, le seul homme de l'université de Lyon. <laughs> and, uh, she had a certain idea, not of France, but of what my thesis should be, and it wasn't, happened not to be mine. <laughs> uh, she was in those days uh, an international lawyer, a very good one indeed, and I had been corrupted by my year at Harvard in 51, 52, where I discovered a kind of uh, political science uh, which was new to me. Uh, and. Uh, so I got more and more interested in what didn't exist in France at the time, and if I wanted to be unkind, I would say it still doesn't, uh, now that Aron is dead. Uh, I discovered a discipline of international relations. What we had in France was wonderful lawyers and very, very good historians, and that is still the case. The political scientists were, to use a term which is often used in economics these days, they were derivative. <laughs> I don't know what it means in economics, by the way. 
so I discovered that, and that's really what I wanted to write. So, I, but the other thing is that people are, who were my classmates uh, at Harvard at the time were absolutely extraordinary. And that what I found in this uh, strange place uh, was uh, an absence of the sort of hierarchy which still exists in France. Uh, of course, uh, professors are supposedly above students, uh, but there wasn't here this sort of glass wall which existed in France between students and teachers. And unfortunately, I think in many respects this glass wall is still there. Uh, so that was one of the things which drove me here, which had actually one very important consequence. It forced me to think about France. And it was much easier to think from the outside. One thing I do want to say a few words about is a, a point uh, raised by Suzanne, which had to do with uh, had to do with leadership, and especially uh, with the goal of leadership. I thought it was quite extraordinary. I mean, I, I was uh, favorably. Uh, uh, um, oriented already, because during the war years, uh, as a, uh, somebody who had been living in France for almost all his life but didn't have French citizenship, or any citizenship at the time, um, he was the voice of hope. Uh, then he disappeared quickly, and then he came back in the pretty horrible circumstances of uh, the war in Algeria, dangers of uh, it expanding into France, and so on. And what is, uh, I think, what remains remarkable <coughs> in, in a sense, bringing to the fore something which, as you pointed out, was, was already there, which was a very profound economic social transformation of the country. But it was buried under a terrible political system. The two things he did, one, was mentioned, and that is uh, that as the son of a teacher, he was a great pedagogue. I reread uh, uh, the gold from time to time. It was quite extraordinary. I mean, here you have somebody uh, taking, uh, you know, 50 million people, whatever the number was then, as his student, and explaining the world to them. Of course, he does it for purposes. He wants their approval for this or that. But he explains what's going on. And he tells them that many of the habits they are used to are quite obsolete and that one has to get out of this. And he does it in such a way uh, that uh, they, should fe she, they should feel proud of following him. And what many of his critics, especially the American ones, never understood was that that kind of pedagogy was absolutely important. He had understood almost from the beginning when he said put in France again in 1944, that you do not get people who have lived in circumstances not only of penury, want, but shame. You don't get them to get out of it by telling them you've all been smart. Uh, it may be true. But incidentally, it wasn't. I have very mixed, uh, very hostile views to those who pretend that everybody misbehaved in France during the occupation. It was not my experience. The school system in particular remain quite extraordinary. But uh, he understood that if you want to get people to move and transform a society, they have to feel proud of themselves and capable of it. Yes, I can. And while he didn't invent the slogan, uh, there are some similarities, maybe a psychological something, between the Obama campaign and the goal uh, in, in his regal way which is, of course, I mean, the speeches of the gold go on for pages and pages, the press conferences. And that was one element. People started feeling, A, more intelligent, B, more knowledgeable, and C, more sure of themselves. The other thing which was not mentioned, and which I probably didn't stress <coughs> enough, was that he put in place uh, a large number of civil servants, former members of Free France, uh, people who had been with him, uh, people coming out of the resistance, who were quite extraordinary people. They were not all of equal competence, but they gave a sense of, of solidity and of reliability. 
and uh, to go back to something Suzanne mentioned, I have very few illusions about uh, Villepin's capacity of being uh, a, a Gaullist leader in present-day France, but he has one thing, which is that he has missed his moment. He would have been one of those people if he had had the possibility. Uh, you know, for whom the sense of the state, the need to change, and absolute rigor in work was very important. So after the Third Rep Fourth Republic, which had been a story of almost continuous scandals, it was quite a change. Plus navigating through all of the uh, uh, difficulties of, of the Algerian war. So that's why I, uh, I mean, let's, why I've always deplored the tendency of American political science uh, to <laughs> really neglect the study of leadership or else reduce it to a few recipes. It's not, it's not so simple. Uh, our political science was largely uh, manipulating mass data. And um, you know, it's, it's f sure, you have to know what's going on in the underground. But if you want to move people, which is what politics is largely about, uh, you have to use other talents. And it was quite interesting uh, in the years after the goal to compare the different styles. Um, the goal gave you this sort of magisterial view of, uh, of the world. Uh, he did it when Nixon and Kissinger came very early in the Nixon administration. And uh, uh, the goal harangued them and gave them a long view of the world and all of its aspects, which managed to intimidate Henry, which is not easy. <laughs> he came back quite, uh, quite impressed. However, um, it was uh, with purposes, of course. When Giscard, who was a formidably intelligent man, uh, became president uh, and made our speeches. Uh, everything he said started with j'observe. <laughs> Didn't work. It's nice to observe things, but that's not, that's not really leadership. It's a sort of detachment. And the least one can say is that the goal was not detached. Uh, so it seems to me there was a whole dimension here to, to political action which American political science missed. What political science in this country has done very well is to accumulate statistics. And that's, of course, important. It's nice to know that 82% of the public want this at one moment, and then the following year it's fallen to 73 or whatever. That, that, has, nothing, that has nothing to do with, with, with leadership. And it seems to me that uh, uh, the Greeks knew more, much more about leadership than we do. So that's, uh, that's it, if you like. Um, I don't know what will happen. Uh, my enthusiasm for Sarkozy, perhaps because I am indeed a, f a friend of Wilpin, is very limited. Um, <laughs> he is undoubtedly an intelligent man, but I don't see a program there. I, I see, uh, uh, you know, there's this famous sentence of a French general, I've forgotten which one, there were so many. Uh, on s'engage et puis on voit. <laughs> well, I, I, it's, that's exactly the method of, of, of Sarkozy. This was not the goal's method. Uh, the goal's problem was always uh, that he saw very far ahead and very far behind. I've forgotten what American uh, uh, personality it was who came to, to Paris and uh, said to the general that uh, she, uh, uh, she had uh, studied French history for the last 500 years, and he said, that's very good. I have studied it for 2,000 years. <laughs> uh, and so, so you have this. And that is not at all what, uh, what we find with Sarkozy. It's too bad, actually. It's a very modern leadership, I'm afraid. I mean, it may change. He still has, uh, even though it had been shortened to five years, still has uh, three and a half to go. But anyhow, he's not entirely my cup of tea. Um, <laughs> it's partly, I must say, it's partly aesthetic. I, I can't, uh, no, I, I can't. <laughs>
Although I'm a, I'm a great admirer of the first of uh, Carla Bruni's records, which is absolutely lovely. Now, on, on Rousseau, uh, I'm very, very glad that uh, even if I hit my head against the wall, literally, in the Broadway garage, I'm sorry I missed this, but I think, uh, if I may sing our praises, that we've produced a remarkable collection of essays, many of which deal with topics that had not been uh, discussed before, which really deal with aspects of Rousseau that nobody had ever, er, ever uh, uh, introduced into the uh, political domain. I, was, I have two very good friends who, uh, uh, one of whom is my best friend, friend who, who deal with uh, uh, Rousseau and the body is not a subject which has been thinking about and which turns out to be quite fascinating. There are other essays dealing with theatre, with all kinds of aspects of Rousseau. And it, it brings uh, one, uh, it, one can draw one lesson from it, uh, which I land on this, which is uh, that it's very good to abolish the barriers between disciplines, not only the barriers between students and professors, uh, which is a hopeless task often, uh, in France and in other European countries, but between disciplines, and that is what in this university the humanities sector has been doing, and the group uh, uh, that uh, we, we put together is indeed half political scientists or historians and half literary people, and it worked beautifully. I am for those kinds of mixes. I'm against specialization. Uh, it's not for nothing that I was a, one of the founders of social studies. Uh, and if it was necessary in 1960, you can imagine how much more necessary it is now. But anyhow, I hope to get, be able to get back to studies of art that have been diverted by the urgency of international relations for the last eight years. It has not been pleasant. I continue to be horrified at the ease with which the American public has accepted practices which were as awful as many of the practices of this administration have been. I don't know if you've seen it, but there was two weeks ago on Frontline a documentary called Torturing Democracy, which was one of the most frightening things I have ever seen because they, they photographed torture of people who had been arrested without any indictment. And I mean, it, it was just under the, There was very little outrage, I have to say, especially in the beginning, but even later, it only concerned, you know, uh, foreigners, uh, uh, Arabs, uh, not our people. So, well, too bad. And I think this was uh, this was not 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 easily uh, forgiven. So now that uh, uh, we are in a new phase, I can always only say what I said to many of my friends the day after Obama's victory which was that I thought that the atmosphere, at least in Cambridge, we only voted for Obama by 88%, <laughs> um, uh, that the atmosphere was exactly that of uh, the liberation of yeah. the yeah. sense of uh, deliverance, the levity of the air, the people yeah. talking to each other without having ever met each other. Oh. How long? I, I wore for the first time an Obama, but I'd had that button, I never wore it. That day I thought I could. <laughs> and I was in a little cafe in the Holyoke Center. Uh, and uh, I was sitting next to a, a, a lady, not young, and her daughter, who talked all the time about the uh, Obama victory. I was eating my sandwich, which was offered uh, by myself. <laughs> and uh, the lady looks at me and says, how long are you going to keep this button? I said, well, I only just put it in. But yes, but how long will you keep it? I said, until I get disillusioned. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then we started talking about all the possibilities and so on. It was wonderful. It was exactly the atmosphere of the little village in the south of France, uh, where I was when France was liberated, and the thousand German stu uh, soldiers who were six months older than I was and who were billeted in this place left totally demoralized because they knew that they had lost the war and that they were in, a, in, 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 enemy, uh, in an enemy milieu. And by the, by the way, this was a village in which there was absolutely no contact, no conversation between those Germans 
uh, and the French uh, peasants and shopkeepers. So again, when I'm told that everybody was a salaud, or, me, or most people were, it is not true. There were enough salauds to go around. But the bulk of the population was, you know, they were fallible human beings. And it was very funny, I mean, I might write something about this someday, to watch their evolution over a period of four years. Everybody, well, in fact, it reminded that too, well, I was reminded of, and I'll stop, um, by the war in Iraq. In the beginning, everybody was uh, pitying me because uh, he was a you know, remarkable uh, winner of World War I. He was venerable. He was politically not particularly known uh, uh, to have uh, strong uh, anti-democratic views. And everybody thought he would protect France. Uh, so my schoolmates uh, in Nice all had uh, parents who supported him for a while. And then as time went by, one could see people changing and completely forgetting, forgetting what their attitudes had been in the beginning. Now, people's memory uh, is rather self-serving. But it was exactly the same uh, here uh, at the time of the beginning of the war in Iraq. The number of people, including among public or unpublic intellectuals, who thought from the beginning that this uh, was a very bad idea, was really very, very small. And I'll end on one little anecdote. Um, I went to a meeting in Berlin in, uh, I've forgotten uh, when it was, Carl, I think it was about four years ago. And it was a very interesting conference. It was a celebration of your retirement from there. And I said, some, my, my role was to talk about the domestic aspect of the war in, in, in Iraq. So I said something to the effect that that was a very painful situation for me because uh, I found that uh, I was completely isolated. Completely isolated. Uh, there were a few people who didn't think that war was a very good idea. The students were going home in the beginning. I was teaching my course on, on war without you at that point. They were, you know, they were going to uh, liberate Baghdad, I mean, mentally, and so on. So it was very, very hard. And it was very hard to get op eds accepted by newspapers if the op eds were hostile. Uh, the Times uh, and the uh, Washington Post were, should I say, collaborationist. <laughs> and uh, it, it, was, uh, it was massively unpleasant, let's put it this way. And then gradually uh, uh, things improved and uh, people forgot what their initial position had been <laughs> just as well. So it's not, uh, uh, it's not a purely French phenomenon of 1940. There were remarkable resemblances. Uh, human nature, as my wife would say, is a complicated thing, and not always a, a attractive one. Anyhow, that's uh, amusing, but I am so grateful for people who have spoken so far, and uh, it's wonderful to see not uh, you know, so many different generations of... Uh, uh, it's wonderful that they're still here, and I'm quite surprised that I'm still here. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, let me just, uh, before I finish, I mean, I can't individually salute everybody, but I do want to make a, a special reference to a very, very dear friend who's here, with whom I have taught, uh, whose uh, son is our godson, and who uh, is going to be the uh, principal, which means president, of the University of St. Andrews and, uh, in, in, in Scotland, Louise Richardson. Uh, uh, we, will, we will have to organize a, a, uh, a sort of uh, um, a pont aérien, you know, like, like as for Berlin in 1948, uh, uh, between here and, and Scotland. And uh, we will go to her inauguration in, in March, I hope. Anyhow, it's a big loss for many of us, but it was wonderful to have you here for all these years and to have written the only sane book that I know on the subject of terrorism. There are other good books on terrorism, but uh, either they are more uh, documentary or they're completely hysterical, like this book of Mr. Bobbitt, which has received so much uh, 
wasted uh, uh, words. I mean, <laughs> no, it's very simply, he wants to, he says that if one fights terrorism, one has to do it legally, and that this means that one should begin by reforming, by changing the Constitution of the United States. The preamble, the articles, so that anything one does then becomes legal. <laughs> and we can no longer be accused of violating the law. And anyhow, that's not my subject. <laughs> Thank you.